let me continue the summarization. I think this summary will be, uh, I mean, you, how, uh, how you will benefit from this summary, I, mean, I imagine, I suppose, would be like going, going over all the titles. Maybe you will come to a point where you feel like, ah, uh, that was the part I didn't quite understand. Well, maybe I could get back to that part and cover it better. Mm -hmm. Because the titles that I talk about today as we learned this, then we learned that, it was related to this, that, so that we learned this again, kind of. These are the, the fundamental titles. I mean, if you feel like you have, you, if you feel strong about the titles that I'm talking about today, well, yes, congratulations, you've done your part in this course. Uh, the other parts are kinds of details, in my opinion. Okay, let me continue without elaborating much. So at some point, we were ready to delve into deep learning. And at that point, we knew how to train neural networks, how to treat them as computational graphs, what is gradient descent, what is a loss function, score function, and how to apply uh, gradient descent to a computational graph like a neural network, uh, which we call the backpropagation algorithm. So with this knowledge, we started talking about first the convolution and the convolutional layers. Convolution was something inherited from the signal processing literature. It is a mathematical operation. And it's used, used widely in signal processing and very widely in image processing. Well, I'm giving the examples from image processing because for convolution, you could give examples from different types of signals as well, but they kind of difficult to uh, uh, comprehend. When it comes to convolution examples for image processing, they are very simple because it is like finding the edges on an image kind of. So what is conv what convolution is, well, it's a complicated uh, mathematical operation. It has time domain uh, operations, it has frequency domain operations without delving into them. It is just a bunch of multiplications, which is done on a part of a signal part of the image using an operator, which we call sometimes the kernel or the filter. Okay, so this is, we are going to be calling it a filter in a deep learning domain. So what you do is you're, you're doing element-wise multiplication. So multiplying this minus one with three, so you have the operations here, so nine operations. And you're calculating a sum and you're writing it to the center point of the region that you calculated the filter and you applied the filter. So this is like the weight operation in artificial neural networks. You have an input, you have weights for each input, and you calculate something. If we could add an activation layer on top of this value, this minus three being fed to an activation function, that would look like a neural network, right? Well, it is, we call them convolutional layers. So you have filters, you have the input signal, it could be an image, we usually don't call it an image, we usually call it an activation because at some point it is the actuations of different layers and it doesn't have to be an image after all. So what you do is you just raster scan, so you just pass the filter over the entire image and you calculate an actuation map. So if the depth of the image, if the depth of the input, I must say, is three, which means the spatial dimensions of the input is, it's a two dimensional signal, 32 by 32. It could be more dimensions. I mean, the spatial uh, dimensions of the input could be different. I mean, it could be a 3D MRI volume, or it could be a 1D signal, time signal of sound, or I don't know, uh, sensory information like an earthquake accelerogram data, I don't know. So this is the spatial dimensions, two dimensional like an image, and these are the channels. So depending on the number of channels, which also we call depth, the depth of the filter must be the same because for each depth, we are multiplying this five by five by three filter. We are calculating a actuation map. And if you have N of these filters, you will be calculating N actuation maps, like the output of the convolutional layer would have N channels, okay? But deep learning was not all about these convolutional layers. I mean, convolution operation was very important when it comes to signal processing based deep learning, but 
there were other layers as well. At the heart of every neural network, just like I said in the previous hour, we have the weight multiplication layers because those weights are the learnable things. It is what we optimize during the training process. Weight multiplication layers change. They are convolutional layers and they are deconvolutional layers. Dense layers are called fully connected layers or linear layers as well. This uh, dense, linear uh, or fully connected, they are being used interchangeably. Uh, they are the main artificial neural network layers where every node is connected to every node in the next layer. We have group convolution. There are different types of weight multiplication layers. These are the heart of it. But other than that, we have the activation layers. Just like I said, to make it a perceptron-like neural network, we need a nonlinear activation. And depending on the type of problem, there are different types of activations. With, with deep learning, with AlexNet, really become very, very uh, widely used on signal-based data like image sound, but SIGMOD or 10H are still being used in LSTMs and other stuff, as you've seen. And there are sampling layers to change the spatial dimensions of the uh, input. There are combinations layer where you combine different features inside the network so that it's not a linear network in a way. It's like more like a directed acyclic graph, uh, which, which, is a, which is a term we inherit from the graph theory. So it is not like a, signal line of serial connections, but multiple connections in one direction. There are no cycles, loops inside, uh, directed acyclic graph. So there's a direction. Always the information is flowing from one side to the other, and there are no loops, directed acyclic graphs. Uh, these combination, la combination layers actually create that uh, acyclic uh, graph uh, structure. And there are input layers. We do different operations at the input, we do normalization. We have reasons to do that. Please refer to the slides and those discussions in the uh, video lectures. And here are the output layers, depending on the type of problem, you needed specific output layers. If you're doing multi-class classification, you need needed, for example, a softmax like uh, output layer, which would convert the score function to probability mass distribution so that you could compare it to a real mass distribution where the probability of that ground truth being one and the other classes being zero and using a loss function like cross entropy or negative log likelihood, remember from the previous week, you just make a calculation. Or if you're doing a regression type uh, operation where, you, where you're trying to estimate the value of something, the example I've given in the previous hour was trying to estimate the, the temperature of the next day. Well, then you would do some values then you do sigmoid, maybe not sigmoid, because sigmoid is bounded between zero and one. If you're trying to estimate the probability of something, probability of rain tomorrow, then sigmoid would be nice, for example. And utility layers, like dropout and batch norm, which helps you to regularize your network. For example, with dropout, you, you kind of refrain from overfitting. Or with batch norm, you make your activation stronger so that the training takes place for deeper networks and et cetera or you use for utilities. There are different types of layers. We've discovered, we've discussed many different types of layers as well. And among these, actuation functions were important. Actuation functions were the functions which gave the ability of an artificial neural network to process nonlinear activation decision uh, boundaries. For different architectures, we have seen different activation functions. Just like I said, ReLU was is mainly used for signal-based image processing and vision applications after AlexNet. But still the other ones, the traditional ones like SIGMOD or 10H are also used. And there are many versions of ReLU. Okay. And we also talked about weight initialization. Although we said that weight initialization is something, um, is an open field of research and it's a, uh, it's a complicated title. We have learned the rules of thumb for weight initialization. First of all, we learned that we shouldn't initialize our weights to zero at all. That's not a good way of doing it. Well, we, we should be giving uh, uh, some random values, that's for sure, but what type of random values? Actually, people have studied this using different mathematical methods. They have come up with solutions where you create a specific distribution of random values, where you had a Gaussian distribution or different types of distribution, depending on different types of reasons. 
Uh, the, so we learned about Xavier uh, initialization, Kymin case, He initialization, or girls in initialization. And we've talked about rules of thumbs for finding the correct initialization for your project. Okay. Uh, and when we were ready, because we know how to initialize network, we know how to apply back propagation. We know about the layers, we know the R architecture, we could run it forward. Now it was time for the training. But training was something that you need to uh, specifically take care of. I mean, that's why we have a term called babysitting the deep learning process. It is like you have to just look at the graphs and babysit it. It's not like push the training button and go sleep and next morning you get with the perfect results. It was not like that. You have to examine the training graphs. Uh, to understand how the training was going on because the training itself had some uh, problems like overfitting, underfitting, and etc. We have covered the, these problems and we learned how to examine these training graphs. The training graphs are during the training, you are trying to lower the loss. So at each iteration, you're changing the weights. And for each mini batch, the loss is presumably and hopefully lower. For the training set, it is most probably lower because that's what the mathematics do. I mean, you're try trying to, you're, you are finding the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights and you're uh, adding up the negative of that derivation direction. So the blind guy is finding its way down with the slope. So the train for the train data, that makes sense. But for validation data, after some point, it didn't change. That was the point we called the inflection point. That was the point we looked for in our graphs and we said, uh, here is the inflection point. So maybe I should stop training at this point because after this point, I am overfitting. There were different types of graph, uh, training graphs we have discussed, which would indicate different things like unbalanced data sets or underfitting as well. So we learned about understanding training graphs. Then we learned about data augmentation. So deep learning required a lot of data. Okay, but we could create data to make deep learning models uh, learn better, to regularize them. And creating, augmenting data for your data set was a handcrafted task, which would require specific uh, context for different type of uh, modalities of data. Like for vision, you can decolorize it, you can detexture it, you can edge enhance it, you can create, rotate it, transform it, affine transform it, pers per, uh, uh, perspective transform it. So for image, you had different things, for sound, different things. For text, it was different. So data augmentation was very important. And that was something you, you should usually do in your projects. We learned about data augmentation. Then we learned about transfer learning. What we said was, okay, there is already a data set, like the image nets thousands, not thousands, millions of annotated images. And there's already LXNet, which was already trained with these millions of images. And it has the capability to categorize the image to a thousand categories. Okay, so, but what I need is not a thousand category for some reason. I need a network with three categories, cat, dog, and elephant images, nothing more. I only have them. That's my domain, that's my problem definition. So what I could do was I could get the pre-trained parts of the LXNet, the convolutional parts, like a feature extractor to me, like an encoder, like a feature encoder to me. I'll get that part. I'll put new fully connected layers and I'll put at the final fully connected layer, not a thousand um, value node uh, fully connected layer, but three fully connected layers because I've got three categories and retrain the system again. So the weights recalculated, the weights maybe fine-tuned, change it, change a bit. Maybe you freeze them, you don't have to. So this was fine transfer learning. For different domains, we could apply transfer learning we talked about. So the general idea of transfer learning is you have a task which you have many data for, you train the task and you transfer the knowledge of that task into another task. So the first task was thousand category classification to three category classification because the features you use for both of them, the knowledge is transferable. 
Okay, then having learned the convolutional neural networks, which was like the starting uh, point of deep neural networks, we learned about sequence models. Uh, this was a different domain because sequence models included signal based signal based sequences and uh, some non signal based unstructured data as well, like text. But before getting into those details, we discussed the definition of sequence. We said that a sequence is thought of a list of elements, can be thought of a list of elements in a particular order. This particularity of the order, the importance of the order, what was what defined the sequence. So, sequence modeling was modeling a sequence like the words or letters of frames, what frames next, what comes next, or depending on the nature of the sequence, a prediction or a sort of classification task. And we learned that unlike deep forward neural networks like CNNs or ANNs, in sequence modeling, the order, hence the history of the elements, mattered. So how? So for example, when you were trying to find it is a bird or not, you use the CNN. But if you were trying to find if this bird is flapping or gliding or it's flipping its wings, you needed a sequence. And that sequence modeling required something different than a feed-forward neural network. Okay? That was a type of what we called the recurrent neural network. We learned about recurrent neural networks. We started with vanilla RNN. Vanilla RNN was a type of neural network where we had these feedback connections. We had this recurrent connection. So the structure was very similar, but the output was being fed to the input in a recurrent neural network. And this created its own mathematics. We had covered the mathematics of the recurrent neural network where we had the input, so being fed to the nodes, but the output of the nodes as well. So that's why when we were covering the actuation function, which is G, the actuation function for this node, we did not only use the input, we used the previous actuations as well. Okay, so the previous actuations was, these were called hidden states. Let's call them hidden states A. We concatenated them, we fed them, like input, we multiply them with some weights. So there's biases for. So we calculated the next hidden state. So where you create the notion of history from previous hidden states, you created the next hidden states using additional input data. So this created a model for implementing sequences. And you added a fully connected layer on top of it to get some output. This is called the vanilla RNN, and this part is called the core RNN. We will remember from our slides. And uh, having learned this, we've learned about unrolling the sequence model in time. What is unrolling the sequence model in time? Well, when you're calling this network, so this uh, RNN core part is here. So this is the output part. In this figure, I mentioned this RNN core part like this and the output part like this. So they are kind of rotated. It was flowing in a horizontal direction. Now it's flowing in a vertical direction from down to up. So I give it an input. The actuation, uh, the hidden states are fed back to create the new hidden state. And using the new hidden state, I'm creating the output with the fully connected layer, right? So I give it an input. Using the previous hidden states, I have an evident state. When I provide the other input, it is like feeding it to the to the uh, same network, just like it is the next layer. So feeding, for example, a sequence of S, it was S plus one, remember that was the mistake in the slides, uh, because it starts from zero to S. So when you feed S plus one sequence, uh, S plus one long, long sequence, S plus one different elements, S plus one different input vectors, actually it is like you're calling a deep neural network of S plus one layers. This was called unrolling the recurrent neural network in time. Because depending on the length of the sequence, the recurrent neural networks, when called with long sequences, were practically some deep neural networks which had those number of layers that, that, that equal the number of the length of the sequence. 
This process was called unrolling in time. Because when you unroll this in time, there's practically no recurrent connection. So you see there's, there was a recurrent, recurrent connection from coming from uh, this node to itself. But in unrolled in time representation, you don't have that recurrent connection. It's like always a forward connection. And it, it is like a directed acyclic graph. It becomes a directed acyclic graph. We can apply back provocation to it. And we apply back provocation to it for training. Okay, that was how we trained it by treating the recurrent neural networks as graphs unrolled in time, time dimension. And we apply back propagation through time to train them. Depending on the type of input output relation, we learned about different types of sequence models, one to one to many to many. many. Please refer to the video lectures for details. But for example, this is a many to many model with delay. So you have many inputs and you're getting many outputs. Delay means you are ignoring some of the outputs and you don't calculate, which means you don't calculate the loss for them. So while in back propagation, you're using the back propagated derivatives of the loss for only these nodes. This is called the delay. So a nice example for it was if you go back to the slide, you'll see that is machine translation. Because when you're translating a many input to many output, like Turkish language sentence with many tokens, many words, to an English, uh, English uh, sentence with many words, many to many, you needed a delay. The network needed a delay, just like the translator waits for a couple of seconds before it starts translating in simultaneous translation. Okay, we discussed all of these. Then we learned about more complex versions of current neural networks. Actually, we have covered synchronous modeling for two weeks only because this is a title of its own. And as you all know, I have a separate course on sequence modeling, which I strongly recommend if you're up to this business. But in two weeks, we try to cover the best way we can about sequence modeling. And also, apart from that two week, the previous week in week 13, we did a live code study on LSTMs. And also you have done lab studies as well. So I think you've covered sequence modeling uh, at an introductory level, I mean, sufficiently for an introductory level course. So the LSTM was an advanced version of an RNN. It's a recurrent neural network. So if the recurrent neural network RNN can be this, this architecture, this architecture can be thought, can be, uh, can be depicted like this, like the input and the previous state being concatenated, Fed to an activation function and you have the new hidden state. If you depict it like, like this, LSTM should be depicted similarly like this with a more complex architecture. LSTM was a handcrafted design. The need for LSTM was when the time LSTM was uh, invented in 1996, 1997 by Shimituber, it was a well-known fact that RNNs were difficult to train because when unrolled in time, RNNs created very deep neural networks and deep neural networks were hard to train because of problems like finishing gradients. And this guy created this LSTM with this single connection here, which avoided this problem of finishing gradients. Some mathematical details here, which I didn't delve into in detail in this course, but I do in the advanced sequence modeling course. LSTM was, capable of easily trained, it could be easily trained. And we could process longer sequences with LSTM. So it was an advanced design and it's still being used today. LSTM is widely used in many industrial applications, including Google. Then we made an introduction to NLP. Uh, just like I said, when, those, when we were covering those weeks, we have a separate course for NLP by Tuvalja. I strongly recommend it. it that is your direction. But we made an introduction to it. We covered the basics of NLP. What is NLP? What is its relation to linguistics? We talked about this. What is its relation to programming? So it was basically understanding documents and contextual nuances of a language and etc. cetera. Um, uh, we did not cover much about NLP, but we said that NLP was a type of sequence modeling business on uh, unstructured data like text. Then we get back to convolutional networks. We discussed advanced architectures. 
because we've, we've covered LXNet, which was the simple architecture, that the simplest architecture you can think of as a, as a deep model. Then we discussed residual net neural networks. We discussed these skip connections, uh, why skip connections worked, what was the effect of skip connections that it made the networks got deeper and deeper. So instead of having 10 layer, 20 layer deep neural networks, we started to have ultra deep layer uh, neural networks like with hundreds of layers, the residual networks and et cetera. Then we talked about the general picture of the evolution of deep uh, convolution neural networks which started at AlexNet. So here in the X axis, you have the operations. In the Y axis, you have the classification accuracies for ImageNet. So we started with AlexNet with low operations, but low accuracy. Then we had the VGG. We had many operations, but not much better accuracy. But in time, you see there is a growing graph of accuracies and operations. So now we have a nice selection of models where you can easily make a trade-off between accuracy and operations because if you're working on an edge device uh, you don't have much power you don't have much computation power or electrical power which is quite correlated and so you can pick the best model you have you have the trade uh, trade-off here or if you have unlimited operations then you can just select this guy which is a, a neural architecture search model so we have seen that, we have seen the evolution, we've talked about evolution of models. And we've talked about some of the uh, architectures here, like Google Net, like ResNet, like ResNext, or Inception ResNet, as you can see, they are, they are important milestones in this evolution. And uh, having talked about these models, one of them was the Inception model. So while ResNet and Kaiminke in Microsoft Asia was trying to get deeper and deeper in models. These guys tried to make it wider and wider to have the multi-scale capability. Why multi-scale capability? We we'll discussed this. So a convolutional layer of filter of three by three can detect edges of three by three size, while a five by five filter can detect edges of five by five size. But if you had them in parallel and concatenated them, you will be concatenated multi. You will be concatenating multi-scale features so that your network will have the capability of processing multi-scale data. We talked about this. Then we talked about object detection. This was a very good example because the nature of the problem required a different architectural design. Because in the end, you 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 have the input of a fixed size data like image. But at the output, you could have varying length data. For example, you, maybe there were no objects. It was a plain C image. Or maybe there were three objects in the image. So depending on the date input signal, you had varying size output. And we've talked about methods to construct this type of output. And we talked about this YOLO architecture, which was a fully convolutional plus uh, fully connected layer architecture that could create varying length data. Because if you remember AlexNet and the trademark of convolutional uh, neural networks was they, uh, they uh, accepted fixed length data and they provided fixed length output. But this guy, Joseph Redmond, found a way to create this architecture called YOLO, you look at once, that would provide varying lengths, varying lengths of output so you could have different number of objects in the image we discussed this architecture and before we discussing before discussing this architecture we discussed the evolution of object detection architectures that led us to yolo today we, we discussed the output layer of yolo it was a very nice design where you had very structured outputs and we also discussed that to be able to obtain this output this guy redmond had to create its own uh, loss functions, which was very complex, if you remember. Then for the final two weeks, we did live coding. The first week was week 12. We were coding the semantic segmentation network. We discussed cross-validation. Please refer to those discussions if you have, if you're unsure about cross-validation. In this, in this example, we have covered um, an example where we get the data 
from some math files. So this was an example where you used a PyTorch model, which interacted with some arbitrary data type, which is not uh, natural to the Python environment, taken from a MATLAB environment, actually. And we trained the data and we have seen the training results. And in the next week, we have done an LSTM example. In this example, for the first time, we talked about embeddings. Still, embeddings is an important title. I cover embeddings uh, in detail in the sequence modeling course and how we converted the unstructured data, the tokens, the words into vectors and then fed them to LSTM models and to make some estimations. This was a, this was a network where we estimated the each word's role in the sentence, like it's a determiner, it's a noun, it's a verb kind of. And that was it. I always love these uh, cheat, uh, cheat sheets where you kind of see everything. I hope at the beginning of the course, this uh, cheat sheet wouldn't make any sense to you, but I think today when you look at it, all parts of it will make sense to you. Well, that was the idea. So thank you for listening to my course. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. Okay.